In this video, I'll... oh, yeah. Let's talk about errors. After 10 collection themed videos, I want to revisit them and make some corrections. The worst thing is having misinformation out there. And here's an example of how misinformation can spread. The Power Macintosh 9500 was unveiled on June 19th, 1995. It was unveiled at an event celebrating the 10th anniversary of Apple introducing the world to the desktop publishing. And they also announced new and updated printers. They released this laser printer at the event, for example. But here's Apple's current online data sheet where they apparently guesstimated that they released the 9500 on May 1st. And that spread everywhere. Wikipedia, AppleHistory.com, the book Apple Confidential 2.0, Low End Mac, wait, using the same case as the 9150. 9150? No, it did not. Hey, at least Cult of Mac got it right. They go on to talk about the six PCI slots and seven expansion bays. Uh, seven? <sighs> With the recent proliferation of period Mac magazines available online, it's becoming easier to fact check this stuff. VintageApple.org recently came to my attention with the most complete collection I've ever seen, and techinsider.org, with all the original Apple press releases. While I get most information studying the machines themselves, articles written at the time are the best place to go for background details, and I'd recommend just avoiding present-day sources. Well, well, no, I don't mean my videos. I mean, for example, those crappy top 10 best and worst Apple product lists that are just there to carpet bomb you with ads. Like, we all know the original iMac 3G, right? So thanks to helpful feedback from viewers, and despite some not-so-helpful feedback, I wanted to set the record straight on the information I presented in my videos. So here's my top six corrections, and without doing ads. Oh. So here we go, number one. In the Power Macintosh 9500 video, I said, For the 9500, they took the 8100 mini tower case and stretched it a few inches to, to a full tower. In fact, to qualify as a full tower, the case must be at least 22 inches tall, whereas the 9500 is about 17 inches. The 8100 style case was correctly identified as a mini tower, since it is not more than 14 inches but anything between 14 and 22 inches is called a mid-tower. Which begs the question, did any Mac hit that 22-inch full-tower mark? What about Apple's first tower design? Apple came out big with its first tower in 1991. Still, the huge Quadra 900 case is only 18 and a half inches. The Power Macintosh G5 slash Mac Pro case is a monster tower, but even including the handles, it's only 20 inches. And the 2019 Mac Pro, which has not yet been released at the time of this video, it specs out just short of 21 inches. Even with the optional wheels added, it's not quite 22 inches. As a side note, the 2019 Mac Pro is really expensive. But the 9500, if you adjust for inflation, was even more expensive. I'm not trying to justify the cost of a new Mac Pro, I just find it interesting. Much like the 9500, you'll pay out a ridiculous sum of money for this machine now, and in 20 years, it'll be worthless beyond a collectible curiosity. Hey, hey, get out of here! Anyway, in summary, the 9500, as tall as it looks, is not a full tower. Apple has never made a computer that big. Uh, well, almost never. In the Macintosh LC video regarding the low-cost 12-inch color monitor, I say, It had a resolution of only 512 by 384 the same as the Compact Max. 
Yeah, except the compact Mac screens were 512 by 342. Before there were standards in the Wild West of early computer development, you could pretty much do what you wanted, and with the original Macintosh's super tight memory budget, not having to draw those extra 42 lines of pixels actually made a difference. That's why they went with the wider 3 to 2 aspect ratio. Starting with the Macintosh 2, Apple adopted the 4 to 3 standard, and that's where you get the 12 inch color monitors 512 by 384. The 4 to 3 aspect became a standard mostly because of early computers that used a television as a monitor. When the Macintosh was in the prototype stage, the plan was to make the resolution 384 by 256. Same aspect ratio, but half the pixels. But when management gave the go ahead to up the RAM from 64K to 128, they were able to scale up the resolution 2x, hence 512 by 342. Ultimately, my point was the low cost 12 inch monitors were not any sharper than the classic Mac 9 inch screens. Okay, we don't need to play that every time. Not so much an error, but in the Macintosh 2SI video, I mentioned that it was the first Mac 2 lacking a math coprocessor chip, or FPU. And this was a cost saving measure. But if you bought a card for your 2SI's processor direct slot, the math coprocessor was installed on the requisite adapter card. This was also Apple's first low profile desktop design, which they would abandon in the mid 90s, by the way. Because the case was so short, it could not hold a vertically mounted card like other Mac 2s. The cards had to be horizontally mounted and therefore required the adapter card. In the 2SI video, I showed some third party PDS adapter card without the math coprocessor installed. Well, later I got this 6100 DOS card upgrade and for no reason a new bus adapter was in there as well. The actual Apple card with the Motorola 68882 math coprocessor. So this is what the real thing looks like. In business and education, these were popular for adding Ethernet capability via Nubus cards. Here's a third party Ethernet card. So this card plugs into the adapter, then the whole assembly plugs into the 2SI's PDS slot. Unfortunately, whoever bought this card cheaped out and didn't get the card with the thin coaxial Ethernet option. That is not a Mac error cord. In the Power Macintosh 4400 video, I mentioned that the 4.5 volt block battery was extinct, and I showed you how to cobble together your own battery out of three AAAs. A viewer points out that currently newer tech sells these obsolete batteries at a reasonable price, so you can choose to ignore that whole section of the video. Damn! Also in the Power Macintosh 4400 video, I point out the GIMO port, but can't find anything in the documentation about it. The NUFO wrote in and informed me that GIMO stood for a Graphic Internal Monitor Out. It exists on the 7200 and 4400 to support PC compatibility card video. He went a step further and provided a GIMO cable. Thank you, NUFO the tiny card with the blades for the port. In the manual for the PC card, Apple calls it the internal PC audio video assembly. Yeah, I like GIMO better. In the same video, I say that the original Barebones 4400 was later revised into a small business Macintosh with a large software package. Turns out there was much more to it than that. For a short time in 1997, Apple was trying to market bundles after they ditched the meaningless Performa designations. An idea that had great success overseas in Europe. There were four solution-oriented bundles. The Home Mac, Small Business Mac, Apple Creative Studio with Avid Cinema Software and Capture Card, and the PC Compatible Mac. The 4400 and 6500 tag-teamed on these bundles. The 6500, offering the Home, Small Business, and Creative Studio editions, and the 4400 offering a lower-end Small Business edition, the one I have, and the PC compatible with Windows 95. 
That way, novice users could buy according to what they needed the computer for, and there would be an appropriate hardware-software bundle included. A good idea, but lost in the shuffle when the G3 line was released with its so-called personality cards. Okay, that's enough 4400 errors, but errors in general. Yeah, tutorial lady, where were you when I needed you? So again, to those who took the time, thanks for all your feedback. Not just corrections, but sharing your ideas, opinions, and stories. And thanks for your viewership. Now, 2,500 subscribers, which helps me to continue to provide this high-quality content. Wow. Hey, Kay, it's Nancy. Um, I forget what I was calling for. Okay, beaded ladies and beaded poodles. I look at this beaded lady. Why would you... ten dollars? There's no shortage of these things. They're all <laughs> over. We sold a couple of brutal things though. We have short sleeve sweaters here somewhere. Is this one? No, this is. One. Here's 1985's Concert Wear Plus playing my favorite, The Entertainer by Scott Joplin. Now I pirated this from a rental copy back in 1989, but who cares at this point? Enjoy. That's why I'm here and what I'm fighting for. Don't copy. Don't copy that fluff.